and welcome to the Old Time Radio Hour. I'm your host, Justine Ward, and each week we bring you a classic show from radio's golden age. Around this time of year, with Halloween coming up, we usually do a series of mystery and macabre radio shows. Special effects made with your imagination and innovative sound effects just can't be beat. This week, we have two episodes of Escape, a high-quality show of adventure and mystery that ran on CBS from 1947 through 1954. Both are set in remote parts of South America. First, we have a script adapted from a Jules Verne story about people in a remote valley in Ecuador. Escape, Country of the Blind, first broadcast March 20th, 1949 on CBS. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape, starring Edmund O'Brien. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are trapped in a remote valley of the Andes, walled in by sheer rock precipices. And surrounding you, closing in on you, is a band of blind men who watch your eyes. Today, with Edmund O'Brien as Nunez, we escape to the mountains of Ecuador and to a remarkable world where sight is unknown, as H.G. Wells imagined it in his gripping story... The Country of the Blind. My name is Ibarra. I'm a mining engineer in Quito, Ecuador, high in the towering Andes. Up until a year ago... My chief sport was mountain climbing. My last climb was an attempt to scale the remote and forbidding peak of Paris a 20,000-foot crag unconquered by man. It is unconquered still. 3,000 feet from the icy summit, we turned back and fed for our lives. All of us escaped except one, a guide named Nunez, who slipped over the frightful precipice and disappeared in the vast chasm yawning 10,000 feet beneath us. The horror of that man's fall has terrorized my dreams for a year. Because of it, I've forsaken mountain climbing for the rest of my life. And that decision still stands, even though today I have seen Nunez. He was sitting on the steps at my shack when I arrived at the mine this morning. At first, I didn't recognize him. He was so much changed. I thought he was some ragged beggar. Is it you, Senor Ibarra? My name is Ibarra, yes. What do you want? You you do not know me, senor? Oh, no, I... Oh, you look like a man I knew once, but he's... He's, he's dead. Dead on the slopes of Paris, go to Petro? Nunez. Nunez. That is my name, senor. At least, that is the name I remember. But, but you fell. I saw you fall. Yes. Oh, it's impossible that you could have lived. Perhaps... The gods of the mountains had some reason to spare me. No, if, if we had any idea that you were alive, but you went down, down thousands of feet. We couldn't even attempt to find your body. I know. I do not blame you. You could not have reached me. And if you had, I, I should not have welcomed you at first. But then, later... What do you mean? Senor, you will not believe what I have to tell. I can hardly believe I'm seeing you, talking to you. Tell me what happened to you. You remember that night, the night I fell? We had been toiling all day, inching our way up a steep ice wall. And as darkness came, we found a narrow ledge, barely three feet wide. We're going wide, but we can get our shelter wall up and throw some of us in. That will be welcome. Yes, but first, we will rest in a moment. Look at that icy devil up there. Christening in the moonlight. There's another 3,000 feet of sheer ice wall. We'll have to cut our own holes from now on. There won't even be ledges like this for resting places. 
see why no one's ever made it. You think we ought to go on? I don't know. Junior, what do you think? It is not my place to say, senor. I was hired to go to the top. I agree. But what do you really think? If I believed in the gods of the mountain as the Indians do, I should be frightened now. Why? Because we have invaded the forbidden circle. This part of the Andes is unmapped, enormous unknown, senor. It is an easy thing to believe strange things in this white loneliness. Some of the legends are fascinating. I've been one one, something about a hidden valley called the Country of the Blind. Yes, it's supposed to be somewhere down there. See? Ah, below it. A fertile valley which was settled many centuries ago and then cut off by the great landslide of Iraq. But why the Country of the Blind? Well, even before it was cut off, the, the people developed a strange children. All of them slowly went blind. After that, their children were born blind. The legend is that the valley was the home of the mountain god. It was too beautiful for human eyes. Ah, uh, but then it's all nonsense. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, it's nonsense. It would be pleasant to find it, though. <laughs> you know the old proverb, in the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. <laughs> I doubt that you could ever find it. I even doubt that it exists. Of course not. I was only joking. Of course. Well, now if we're resting... You'll make the shelter wall, eh? Right. I'll give you a hand in a minute. Believe me, Bara. The two cases, they give up this time. They never realize... Hey, I'm, I'm slipping! Stay Stay in! In! Stay in! My foot slipped on the treacherous ledge and I had gone over. I slid down the icy slope for perhaps 200 yards, sticking frantically with my feet, with my hands, for some kind of hold. And then I went off, falling far out into the icy black night, falling down! thousand feet, and then just a heavy, stinging impact of snow. I'd fallen onto an almost perpendicular slope, and once again I was sliding down, down, tumbling over and over. But now, around me, over me, an immense avalanche of snow was rumbling, sliding with me. Suddenly I realized that my own motion had almost stopped, and it was the snow that was moving. I was riding the avalanche. At almost the same moment, I went over the second was higher than the first, much higher, than 4,000 feet. I fell with the snow for one two minutes every second, expecting the terrible final impact. But the impact never came. Miracle of miracles, that sheer wall blended almost imperceptibly into another slope. And again, I was flying. And gradually, as the arc of the slope curved away, I felt myself low down. I was whirled along on top of the avalanche, and then, as it subsided, out onto the gentle snow, upon a gentle slope, and finally, I rolled to a stop, and lay still. When I awoke, it was morning, and I was covered with snow. I shook off the cold white blanket, rolled over on my back, and looked up. My heart almost stopped as I saw from where I had fallen. The mountain towering eight, ten thousand feet above me. Carefully, I felt myself. My, my clothes were torn. I was bruised and bleeding. I ached in every muscle, but I had not broken a single bone. I lay there and offered up a prayer to the gods of the mountain. Far below me lay a lush valley sparkling in the morning sunlight. I could see the stately trees and green meadows fresh with dew. I started down, but it was still an arduous descent. The farther down I got, the more I realized the beauty of the scene. This was a hidden paradise I'd fallen into. And I was the first man ever to see it. So I thought. But I was wrong. I realized that first when I saw the cultivation in the meadows. And then the walk. Well-kept stone walks laid in a symmetrical pattern all over the valley. And then I saw this. There was 
were men and women lying under the trees, resting nearby a collection of windowless huts marked the village. And the plastering of the houses was done in a wild variety of colors. I thought to myself, the plasterer who did that must have been blind as a bat. Then I saw two of the men quite close to me. They were standing on a bridge over the little stream. They were dressed in odd, loose clothing, and there was a strange look about their faces. They failed to notice me as I approached until I shouted. Suddenly, they looked up attentively in my direction. I waved wildly at them, but they took no notice. Why, the fools must be blind! Blind? Could it be that I had fallen into the country of the blind? In the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. I walked towards the men by the stream, and I spoke to them. Hello! You needn't be afraid. I, I won't hurt you. I come in peace. It, it is a man, or a spirit come down from the rocks. Well, I'm a man, all right, just like you, but well, I've, I've had a miraculous escape, and now I find myself here in, in your valley. Valley? Come hither. Let me feel of you. Well, certainly. Yes. Um. Yes. My face? Yes. <laughs> you see, I, I'm indeed a man, like yourself. Yes. My lips, they, they move with speech. Yes. And my eyes. Oh. oh. Careful, Ed. Gently on the eyes. Eyes? That is strange. Feel this, Korea. Yes, I feel. Careful. Did you. You feel my eyelids flutter? He is but imperfectly formed. Some strange bulge there. Unseemly. No, no. Your, your eyes are shrunken in, but mine are whole. I can see. See? See? Pedro, he is a strange wild one. Where does he come from? Down out of the rock? No. No, from over the mountains, out of the country, beyond, beyond where men can see. From Bogota where there are a hundred thousand people and, and the city stretches out of sight. Sight? What strange words he uses with, without meaning and feel the coarseness of his hair like a llama's. Yes. And you have come into the world. In, no. No, out of the world. The big world beyond the mountains. The world that stretches 12 days' journey to the sea. Our fathers have told us men may be made by forces of nature. It is the warmth of things and moisture and rottenness. Come, let us lead him to the elders. There's no need to lead me. I can see. See? Yes, of course. Oh. I didn't see a water bucket. His senses are still imperfect. He stumbles and talks meaningless words. Lead him by the hand. But look, I... <laughs> well. <laughs> All right. They had forgotten even the words associated with seeing, and they thought I was an idiot, only half-formed, especially when they led me into the pitch blackness of one of their windowless huts, and I stumbled over something. Oh, oh. oh thousand pardons, Medina Sorota. <laughs> he is a clumsy one. I'm sorry I fell down. I couldn't see in the darkness. Who is this, and what is he saying? He is but newly formed. He has come down from the rocks. He stumbles as he walks and mingles words that mean nothing with his speech. He is a wild man out of the rock. No, I come from Bogota, over the mountain. You hear, you hear? Bogota, he uses wild words. His mind is hardly formed. He has only the beginnings of speech. Bogota? Yes, I... <laughs> well, I come from the great world where men have eyes and see. That must be his name, Bogota. He stumbled twice as we came thither. He must be tall. Now, don't you understand? I can see, but but not in the dark. To you, darkness or light, it, it's all the same. But to me, to us who can see, to us outside in the world beyond the mountains... Mountains? What are mountains? Well, very well, then. Beyond, beyond the rocks. There is nothing beyond the rocks. That is the end of the world. Oh, but surely you must realize that the sky above covers more than this valley. Sky above? <laughs> There is nothing above but the roof of rock. It's very wrong, my children. He shall have to be taught from the beginnings. Take him away, feed him. It shall be done. But guide him. See that he does not 
stumble over my daughter again. Do not fear, Father. I shall guide him myself and feed him. Very well. Come, take my hand. Thank you. It'll be a pleasure to get outside again out of this darkness. Come this way. Thank you. What is your name? Regina Sarote. Mine is Juan. Juan Nunez. And I... Ah, sunlight. This is better. And now I... Feel beautiful. I, I cannot tell what a wonderful thing you are to see. Please, I'm afraid for you. Afraid? Yes. You do not learn quickly. He's speaking such strange words. They may not be so kind to you. They might be angry. They might even destroy you. This thought had not occurred to me before. Suddenly, I had a twinge of fear. Still, the proverb kept running through my mind. In the country of the blind, a one-eyed man is king. But try as I would, I could not make them understand my wonderful gift of sight. They simply could not comprehend it. Worse, they were not impressed. They thought me stupid and untaught, almost an idiot. Day by day, I learned their peaceful ways, but they could not learn mine. It was getting on my nerves, and theirs too, perhaps. Bogota! Bogota, come hither! Bogota, you move not... No, and I won't, you old beetle. I'll show you. I'll leave the path. Bogota, trample not on the grass. It is not allowed. Well, how did you know I stepped on the grass? I heard, of course. Heard? Well, I didn't make a sound. Why do you not come when I call you? Can you not hear the path as you walk? I can see it. There is no such word as see. Cease this folly and follow the sound of my feet. My time will come. You will learn. There is much to learn in the world. Has no one ever told you, in the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king? Blind? What is blind? Oh, never mind. Go on. Bogota, I must warn you. Just keep quiet and learn. And stop this nonsense about seeing. Nonsense, is it? Well, I'll show you. I've taken enough of your insults. Unformed mind got no sense yet. I'll be king here. I can see and I'll be king. Bogota, stop it. No. No, I'm through with your orders. I'll show you what an advantage sight can be. I can hit you, hurt you, and you can't see me to strike back. Bogota, there must be no violence. You must come peacefully. By heaven, I'll hit you if you come any closer. I swear I will. Bogota, put down that spade and come off the grass. You don't understand. You're blind and I can see. I can see. Now, Bogota, you must not... I'll hurt you. I swear. Leave me alone. I hit his arm, turned and ran over the wall, outside their valley, back to the rocks, to the precipitous cliff I'd come down. But when I reached that sheer rock wall, I knew there was no place to go. For two days and nights, I stayed outside the valley, hungry and cold. And then I realized the hopelessness of my position. I, I was trapped. I must spend the rest of my life here. There was no way out. So, I went back. <laughs> Yes, I was mad. I admit I, I'm only newly made. That is better. And you still think you can see? No, no. That, that was folly. The word means nothing less than nothing. And what is overhead? Rock. There's a roof above the world, a roof of rock and very smooth. Very well. And look, now... Look, before you ask me any more, give me food or I'll die. Very well. Give him food. Yes, Father. And after that, the most menial tasks in the village. Guard him well, and perhaps, perhaps he shall learn yet. Thank you, thank you. Sorota, 
Why is it you have no husband? I have a disfigurement. He's long here. Your eyelashes? But they are beautiful. You can see the disfigurement. Why, you're the loveliest girl in the valley. But they wouldn't know, would they? And so, you have no lover. No. Adina Sirota, what do you think of me? Do you think of me as an idiot like all the rest? Oh, no. You have much to learn, but you will learn it, I'm sure. And you are kind and gentle. And your voice is soft. You speak the words that are soft and warm. No one has ever spoken such words to me. I shall speak them often, Ladina Sirota. You are the only one in this valley, in this world, I care for. And so it began. I, the village idiot, the slave boy who dreamed to be king, I, with my eyes still whole, fell in love with Medina Sorota, the daughter of the elder of the village. Only to her could I open my heart without fear. Only to her could I speak of the beauty I could see around me. It's a beautiful valley, Medina, green with grass and yellow with sunlight and flowers, bright flowers dotting the hills. Yes. And in the cool of night, the stars gleam like diamonds in the sky. Oh, the words sound lovely. But what are stars? Well, they're... <laughs> no, you wouldn't understand. And what do you mean, in the cool of the night? You still get that confused one. The night is warm. The day is cool. No, no, it's you here who have them backwards. Because the darkness means nothing to you, so you work in the cool of night and sleep in the heat of day, but... You are teasing. No, no, I'm not. Oh, what does it matter? All that matters is you. You here beside me. Medina Sarota. I love you. And I love you. I know they still think me an idiot, but you, you listen to what I say, and you don't think me an idiot, do you? Oh, oh I like to hear you speak. Then, will you, will you marry me? I would be very happy. I will not have it. But, Father... He is an idiot. He has delusions. He cannot do anything oh, right. He is getting better. He's better than he was. And he is strong and kind. Stronger and kinder than anyone in the world. And he loves me. And I love him. No. I will not have it. Great fire, if you please. Yes? What is it, good doctor? I have examined Bogota, and the case is clear to me. I think very probably he might be cured. Ah? Huh? And how might that be done? His brain is affected by something. I believe I know what it is. Those queer things he calls eyes. Where we have but an agreeable depression, he has great lumps. Consequently, his brain is in a constant state of irritation. But uh, what can be done to cure him? It's a very simple surgical operation. To remove the cause of the irritation, we will merely cut out his eyes. But they say it will make you well. You don't understand, Medina Sarota. My, my world is sight. You wouldn't want me to lose my most precious possession. I don't know. Well, there are so many beautiful things to see. The, the flowers, the... Far sky with its drifting clouds, sunset, stars, and you. Just to see you, it, it's good to have sight. And I would never see you again. I wish sometimes you would not talk like that. Like what? I know it's pretty. It's your imagination. I love it. But now... Now? You want me to... Medina Sorota... If I were to consent to this... Oh, if you would, if only you would. What else can I do? My dearest one. My dearest with a tender voice. 
I will repay you. Oh, Matina. Be brave. Carry my voice in your thoughts. Now, I must go. And tomorrow. Yes? Tomorrow will be forever. Goodbye. Goodbye, Medina. I suppose I knew it then when I said that. I only meant to go up on the rocks and look out over the valley. To spend my last days feasting my eyes on the wonderful, beautiful world of light and color. But when I got there, it was too beautiful, too lovely. This valley that's home of the mountain gods. Beautiful and forbidden. I drank it in, the green of the fields, the blue of the gently curving stream, the orange of the lichen and the rocky crevices. Then I climbed higher to see the great snow-capped peaks towering above and away to the distant sky. And higher as the shadows turned the snow to purple and crimson and deep blue. The valley was far below and as beautiful as a painting. But like a painting, it looked unreal. Medina Sorota was small and far away distant dream, and the world of sight was here, here, all around, overpowering, wonderful. I turned and began to climb up that sheer rock wall. How many months it took me to make my way out over those mountains, over glaciers and snow fields and sheer precipices, I I cannot guess. How I lived through the cold and the hunger of it, I, I cannot tell you. But I am here at last, back from the country of the blind. Good heavens, man. What an experience. Terrible and wonderful. But you, you're not sorry you came back. Sorry? I I see her face clearly now. It, it's the only thing I see. No, yes. Uh, come. You need food. Here, take my hand. Thank you. Where is it, Senor Ibarra? No, yes. Yes, yes. The gods of the mountains have had their revenge. Those months of crawling over the snow and ice with the sun glaring down, yes, I am... Escape, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald, has brought you Edmund O'Brien in The Country of the Blind by H.G. Wells. The radio adaptation was by John Dunkel. Featured in the cast were Barry Kroger as Ibera and Peggy Weber as Medina Sorota, with Harry Bartell, Byron Kane, Edgar Barrier, and Wilm Herbert. The special musical score was conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week, you are prisoner in the magnificent mountain retreat of the richest man in the world, yet in love with his beautiful daughter. While haunting you, terrifying you, is the certain knowledge that the only sure escape would be death. Next week, Escape with F. Scott Fitzgerald, Amazing Story, The Diamond as Big as the Ritz. Good night, then, until this same time next week, when once again CBS offers you Escape. Edmund O'Brien appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers, producers of Michael Curtiz's Technicolor production, My Dream is Yours, starring Jack Carson and Doris Day. This is Roy Rowan speaking. In just a few moments, the last start rolling on CBS's great Sunday night of stars. Within the next two hours, five of America's top comedians will unroll their newest wares. Laman Abner, Amos and Andy, and Jack Benny. 
Nowhere else in radio will you find such superb and varied comedy as in this two-hour period. Lum and Abner and Amos and Andy will be heard over most of these same CBS network stations. And now, stay tuned for the Jack Benny Show, which comes to you over most of these stations with the heartthrob of Waukegan facing the rivalry of Hollywood's Van Johnson. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. You are listening to the Old Time Radio Hour, broadcast each week over the World Wide Web with your host, Justine Ward. Next, we have a master of the macabre, Vincent Price, starring in a story about a group of explorers in the jungle. Be careful of the piranhas. Escape. Bloodbath. First broadcast, June 30th, 1950, on CBS. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape, brought to you by your Richfield gasoline dealer and the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York. Marketers of Richfield Gasoline with Xylene, Rich Lube, All-Weather Motor Oil, and other famous petroleum products. Look for the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Tonight, we escape to the jungles of South America and a seething tale of terror and violence as told by James Poe in Bloodbath, starring Mr. Vincent Price. By portaging the rapids and walking the mules in the shallower stretches, we'd managed to get our supplies and equipment more than 1,700 miles up the river. After this, further navigable passage being impossible, we'd traveled by foot, hacking our way through the thick, steaming jungle, coaxing and goading the heavily laden beasts. We'd left the jungle and begun the climb. Eleven days later, high in the Andes, we found our objective... We set to work, hard work. And then, on a hazy afternoon in late May, we found it. We shall never forget the scene. Below us, the mountain swung down to the jungle which stretched eastward, far as the eye could see. The peaks above us had cut off the setting sun, and the light had a curious violet quality. The dank, chill wind whispering and gusting set the sparse timber scrubs to trembling and shuddering, and the mules, disdainful of their five strange masters, foraged the cacti and dwarf pine. The instruments were set up and the specimens were at hand, and now, crouched and tense, we leaned forward. How about it, Hess? Wait. The tube's got to warm up. Come on, come on. Wait, will you? I've waited five years for this moment. Five? Five hundred, you mean? Five million? Come on, Hessie. How about it, Hess? Mm-hmm. Okay. Give him the sample, O'Brien. Yeah, here. Come on, baby. Shut up, will you? Shh. Here goes. Switch on. Holy cow. Good. Good. It's fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Hattie. What's the word? Yeah, Hattie. Jim, gentlemen. Gentlemen. Unless this machine is busted... Unless this Geiger counter has forgotten its multiplication table, we have discovered the richest load of uranium ore known to man. I won't go into the details of how we'd come to locate the ore because that's a story in itself. Suffice it to say that late in the afternoon of that hazy May day, the five of us, gamblers all, came to the end of our rainbow, found our pot of gold. The vein runs all the way up the side of the mountain. Must be worth a million bucks. A million? A billion? A trillion bucks! <laughs> 
Do you boys realize what we've got here? Sure we do. We've got the world at our feet. Why, the man who gets the strike registered in his name can be a king. Every country in the world is going to come running up to him with trunks full of money and power. Ah, <laughs> you tell him, Hesse. Power? Yeah, we'll make the United States the most powerful nation on earth. Why the United States? Oh, you wouldn't sell to anybody else, would you? <laughs> I'm a businessman, Harris. You're a fool. No, no. I'm a businessman. A trillion. <laughs> oh, gents, we've got the world at our feet. Split five ways. The world at our feet. Split five ways. That night, as I lay huddled under my thin blanket, I wondered what it would be like being a wealthy man. Wondered if it were really true. Wondered how it would affect the others, how it would affect me. In the morning, we were to set off on the long return journey down to the jungle and through the jungle to the launch and down the river to civilization. There, we'd register our claim, purchase, if need be, the land, lease it perhaps from the government. Hmm. Oh, millionaires. World at our feet. Uranium. Enough to blow up the whole universe. Power. Harris, wake up. Uh, oh, what's the, what's wake the up, time? Harris, wake up. Oh, good morning, millionaire. Weems, wake up. Uh, uh, Sun's coming up. Hey, uh, hey, where are the others? They're gone. Gone? gone? Yes, Dumont and O'Brien. They took the mules and most of the food and cut out. When? How do I know when? Sometime during the night. But why? Why? A trillion bucks, that's why. Oh, no, no, no. Once they get down to the jungle, they'll have to travel on foot. There's ten days' march to the river. If they beat us to the boat, we're stuck with 1,500 miles of jungle between us and safety. Fifty? Impossible. We'd never make a hundred. That's right. We've got to catch him, or we're dead. We traveled as lightly as possible. It was a risky business, doubly so, because O'Brien and Dumont had taken our guns with them. The only weapons we had between us were one long machete and two pocket knives. These would be of little protection against jaguars, bushmasters, tapirs, bow constrictors, and the rest of it. Fortunately, they'd left our number one necessity to survival... They'd forgotten to take our quinine. This and our food was all we carried. The long descent to the jungle was slow going on foot. It was here that we nearly gave up hope. We moved as fast as we could, but we were no match for men who were riding. But we reached the jungle. Then things took a better turn. Here, the thick vines and heavy undergrowth was, we knew, almost an impossible hazard for a riding man. And we could see their boot prints mingled with those of the mules. We knew that they were having trouble, too. The animals were afraid of many things in the jungle. Would balk suddenly require careful handling? We pushed ahead as rapidly as possible, battling mosquitoes, pume flies, matukas, and the blood-sucking carpato ticks and... Of course, the jungle itself, with its never-ending barrage of razor grasses, needle vines, swamps, bog traps, and so forth, it was hot, stinking hot, and the going was hard, but we had to make it. We couldn't travel at night. They'd taken our flashlights. We'd bundle up as best we could, protecting ourselves, not from the cold, it was hot and muggy, even at dawn, but from the mosquitoes. And as we progressed towards the river area, from the bat, vampire bat. <laughs> Ever seen them? <laughs> They're small, rather fragile-looking little things. By day, they hang heads down from the trees, wings folded like, like clusters of rotten fruit. By night, they hunt. They have razor sharp teeth, bite like the finest steel scalpels. Their object is to break the skin very delicately, start the blood to coming, and then they simply hang on and sit. Without mosquito netting, we had a rough time of it, a sleepless time. But we managed to keep on going. And on the third day. Uh, it's not your fault. We can't make it to the river before them. We got to lose it. We've got to make it right, Wayne. And even if we do catch up, they got the gun. Uh, huh? What are you talking about? Quiet, quiet. I heard something. What did you hear? Gunfire. Yeah. 
Come on. They can't be more than a mile or two ahead. Come on. We ran through the jungle, following the fresh marks of the animals and the two men. And a half an hour or so later, we broke into a little clearing, and there was two marks. He's dead. Shot in the back. <laughs> Good old old sweet guy, that old here. Come on. Let's turn him over. He's ready to sweat huh? Yeah. yeah. It's malaria. You see his face? Good old Obi. And Dumont came down with malaria, probably started to slow him down. Sweet guy, that old guy. Come on. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Hey, they should have remembered the quinine. I got no sympathy for Zuma. Uh, you know, you know what would be nice, for If that, if that Obi should get malaria now. Yeah. He'd be helpless. He'd ask me for quinine. And I'd throw him a stone. On we went. Now there were no boot marks with the mule tracks. Apparently, O'Brien was riding one of the animals. From time to time, we'd see a flurry of tracks turned up as though he had had to dismount to tug one of the beasts back onto the trail. We followed the tracks for another two days, and then on the sixth day, we found one of the mules. How you feeling, boy? Huh? Where's your saddle? He really looks beat. Look at those marks on his flanks. Vampire bat. Yeah. That leaves O'Brien on foot. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, you hear that? It's the launch. Where did the river? He's starting the motor. Come on. Oh. Yeah. It wasn't very far, just a few hundred yards. And the path was soon with O'Brien's discarded supplies. Quite suddenly, we came out of the jungle and onto a narrow white sandbar. The river. And there, not 30 feet away from us, just drifting off into the deep, dark, fast-moving waters, was O'Brien and the launch. O'Brien! Look at him. He's like a skeleton. The launch lurched dizzily as it floated downstream. O'Brien was feeble, sweating, possessed. He had the fever, had it bad. Come on, let's go after you him. You can't. This is piranha water. Animal fish, I'll eat you, Happy. Yeah. Hey, Obi. Hey, you know me, Obi. Your old pal, Happy. Hey, what do you say, Obi? Huh? Huh? Bring it, pal. He staggered dizzily about the cockpit, trying to start hey, the engine. He was laughing, and he was so weak that he could barely spin the flywheel to the kicker. Obi! He's the... Good Lord, he's in the water. The fish, the piranhas. Oh, they got him, they got him. Get to look at this. One moment we saw him swimming weakly. His large, fever-ridden eyes turned imploringly toward us, and the next moment he was gone, leaving only a large, red, churning patch on the water. The piranhas are small. Rarely more than 12 or 14 inches long. Small fish with large, powerful jaws, teeth like broken glass, and an insatiable, maniacal appetite for flesh. The launch, caught by the deep, fast-moving waters, rocked softly this way and that and moved on downstream. Away. Away around a bend and out of sight. The march of science over the years has produced better than ever gasoline for your car. But now science adds one of the greatest gasoline components of all. It's called xylene. Xylene, a super gasoline component, adds two great qualities to gasoline. Xylene gives higher than ever antidote performance. Xylene means power. Today, every gallon of Richfield gasoline contains xylene. If you want a motor that runs quiet as a whisper, if you want pickup and power to spare... Try Richfield Gasoline with Xylene. Your Richfield dealer offers a choice of two great Richfield Gasolines with Xylene. Richfield High Octane at regular price for the average motor. Or Richfield Ethel. Ethel at its best for tip-top results in the highest compression motors. Drive in where you see the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Get Richfield Gasoline with Xylene. Xylene, one of the highest Antinoch components in gasoline history. And now we return you to Escape, starring Vincent Price. We picked over the supplies O'Brien had left on the shore. There wasn't much we wanted. 
A gun without ammunition, a few tins of food, a tent and some bedding, cooking equipment, a coil of rope. We loaded these things onto the mule and set off through the jungle, downstream along the river's course. Fifteen hundred miles to civilization. And we had it tough. The jungle was thick along the river's bank, and we made little progress. Not more than five miles that day, but the next day, we rounded a bend, keeping close to the shore, and there, about a quarter mile below us, and nuzzling the opposite shore, grounded on the sand, lay the launch. Looks shallow enough here. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, but what about the fish? How deep does it look to you, Harris? It's the deepest spot on me. Oh, I don't know, maybe two and a half feet, maybe three. Most of it's less than that. I got an idea. Shoot. We've got to get across the launch, see? Yeah. So here's what we do. We throw away everything. There'll be food and water on the launch, see? Yeah. Now, you see that little patch of sand in the middle of the river where the bar shows? Yeah. We go that way. That's bound to be the shallowest way, see? How do we go? On the mule, the three of us. Ah, you nuts. This mule ain't in such bad condition it can't get the three of us across 70 feet of shallow water. What do you say, Harris? Why not? All right. I'll get aboard first. Come on. Get farther up, Wimsy. You're the lightest. Yeah. Harris, you get on next. Huh? Hang on to Wimsy. Yeah. Here, here. Carry this coil of rope around your neck. We okay. may need it. I've got the machete strapped to my back. Hey, you set, Wayne? Yeah. Uh, now hold tight to me, Hess. Don't worry. If I go, you go too. Yeah. And if he goes, I go. <laughs> so let's hang on, gents. Yeah. Let's really hang on. As long as he's moving fast, he can't get at his legs. Isn't that right? He's not showing anything to him but hoops and hair. Hold his head up, Wayne. Don't let him look down. Uh, no. All set? Yeah, all set. All right, here we go. Right, get off. Come on, you Come on, baby. I felt the mule oh, lurch when he stepped oh, into the water. The sand was closer here than on the shore. Sand, huh? Ahead, not on, 40 feet away, lay the little spit of land. The mule refused to run, couldn't run, and before he'd taken 10 steps, I knew he was too weak to support the three of us. From every direction in the swirling water about us came small, shadowy, dark shapes. Come on. The piranha. Don't stop. Come on, baby. Keep uh, moving, baby. Come on. Move along, baby. He can't do it. You gotta do it, baby. Come on. Three come on. other. What are those? Piranhas were churning the water about us, and coming in from beyond them were four or five long, dark shades, six and seven feet long, thick and wriggling. Eels. Electric eels. Jump, uh, sting them. Get along. To the back. Get into the sandbar. Faster, faster. Come on. <laughs> Made it. It's true about electric eels. <sighs> I can throw a jolt that'll kill a jaguar. Make a jaws like a vice. So, here we are, gentlemen. Stuck. Just 30 feet of water between us and the shore. Get across it, and we can get to the launch and the civilization and all the rest. Oh, the three of us are too much for that mule. Uh, only 30 feet. Why, you could run it in seconds. You see those little shadows around us in the water? I see those little shadows around us. They don't have to draw pictures. Hey, uh, oh, here's another bright idea coming up. As a matter of fact, yeah. Yeah, hold on to your hat, Harris. We got that curl of rope. Here. Yeah. The mule could carry one of us. That mule's not in such bad shape, you know. Yeah. Tie the rope over his bridle. Then one of us pulls him over with him fast. You see, one rides, and then the other two pull him back. Yeah. yeah. And the next one gets on. Yeah. What do you say? Oh, he can't stay here. It's unnatural. Who uh, goes first? Me, on account I'm the lightest. I won't tire him so much. How about it, Harris? All right. Well, get going then. Okay. Tie that rope to his bridle. I'm doing it. All right, give me the machete. What do you want the machete for? I want it, that's all. Give me. Uh, okay. All right, yeah. now you two get at the end of the spit. Because when you pay out the line, you don't get it caught in his legs. Well, you think of everything. That's right, I'm a smart boy. I'm ready with the line. You sure it's tied fast to the bridle? Yeah, I'm sure. No funny business, Weems. All we got to do is jerk this rope once while you're over that water and you're done for. You're a sharp article. <laughs> yeah, that's right, but not sharp enough. Hey, Weems, you cut the rope. Come on, suckers. The rope, our only salvation, was cut. And now Weems, grinning and riding, was out into the stream, heading for the shore in safe. He went not 15 feet when one of the long, dark, wriggling shapes made for the mule and got his leg. The mule reared up on his hind legs, the eel clinging to his foot, pumping paralyzing shocks into him. Weems clutched his neck with one hand and slapped him on the flank with the flat of the machete with the other. The mule came down and more eels went for his legs. He began to lurch sideways. Ween swung the long steel blade in an arc, barely missing the mule's leg, and connected with one of the eels. Here seemed to stand 
not end. His other arm released the mule's neck. The arm holding the blade was extended stiffly, still caught in the thick, muscular back of the electric deal. And then the mule reared again, and wings fell back into the water. The mule, freed of wings, made the shore and vanished into the jungle. We turned away. No man could watch what was happening to Weems and retain his sanity. And so, there we were. Hess and I on that sand spit which the river was slowly washing away. Night coming, the vampire bats coming, and all about us, the electric eels and the little cannibal fish waiting. was no moon. There were evil stars, red and yellow. It was a black sky, and against it, blacker shapes, the vampire bat. We waved our arms and kept them off, but again and again, during that long and terrible night, they brushed against us, squealing and squeaking, trying to get it. Dark, evil, thirsting bats. A thousand years later... Came the dawn. That water's taken a lot of sand away. This thing isn't much bigger than a card table. Mm. Look at them. Look at those fish. You think they had enough to eat yesterday? Mm. Mm. Listen, Harris. No matter what happens now, at least you and I have played it square, right? Yeah, that's right. Shake my hand, Harris. All right. Because... I think I got an idea on how we can get out of here. What? Yeah. Look up there. Yeah. See? See that vine hanging down from the big tree? It's over the water and it must be 15 feet up. Yeah, yeah, but if you were on it, you could do a tars into the shore. The rope? Oh, that's right. Now, if we can just lasso the end of that and pull tight, we'll have enough swing to make it across. Swing like a pendulum, if you follow me. One guy gets on the other's shoulders to swing over to get the start, see? Then when he gets to shore, he fastens a rock. And swings the rope back to the other. Uh, that vine will hold. It'll work. It took us two hours before we managed to lasso the end of that vine. And then we tested it again and again until we were positive it would hold a man's weight. And then we were ready. Uh, stand good and steady now, pal. I'm going to go easy on you, but don't shake. Because if you spill me in that water, I'm a gone guy. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. Good luck. Uh, here. No! I felt his feet leave my shoulders, and then he was off, skimming the water with his feet drawn up, and then, miraculously, he was on the shore. Good boy! Good boy! <laughs> yeah! Like a breeze, huh? <laughs> like a breeze. Hey, uh, any rocks around there? Sorry. Smiled at me and shrugged and then looked down the stream at the launch. I knew that smile, that trillion dollar smile. It said, so long, sucker. Don't do it, Hess. Send me the rope. <laughs> You're too nice a guy, Harris. You and I would never get along. You you can have it all, Hess. Every scrap of it. Only for the love of mercy, send me the rope. No, no, you want some. You wouldn't approve of what I mean to do with it. Hess! <laughs> he stood there laughing at me and shaking his head slowly. But uh, above him, just over his head, was another vine, thick and mottled, and it was moving. Look out, Hess! Hess! <laughs> he didn't understand or didn't hear me. Just stood there, smiling and shaking his head. The ball constrictor dropped heavily and accurately, a thrashing tangle of scaly muscles. <laughs> alone. All alone. Except for the ever-waiting piranha. Hess's body was hidden by the low, scrubby vines and palmettos. Several hours later, I saw the boa, now gorged, slither lumpily away. I waited, and I waited. From time to time, I thought of stepping out into the stream. It would be over very quickly, I told myself. Very quickly. I couldn't. 
And then I noticed an odd thing. The current which had been sweeping the sand away had shifted slightly. A whim, a miracle. And now new sand from some sunken bar was beginning to pile up between me and the shore, grain by grain, rib by rib. I watched it. And I watched. And I watched. And at five o'clock that afternoon, I walked ashore to the lawn. And didn't even get my feet wet. It's nice where I live. Quiet little streets, nice people, nice kids, nice country. Peaceful. Nice peace. I know where there's enough uranium to blow it all to hell. Want it? Just go up the river. Up the river, it's, uh, it's for the taking. As Dumont and Obi and Weems and Hess. A trillion bucks worth. Enough to give the whole world a bloodbath. Yourself included. Warm summer weather makes you think of baseball games, picnics, and holiday driving. But be sure your car is ready when you are. Get Richfield All Point Safety Service. The service that puts your car in top shape for warm weather driving. With Richfield All Point Safety Service, you get a careful All Point lubrication job that protects the chassis, transmission, and differential. You get lubricants that stick to your car's ribs no matter what the temperature you get the protection of Rich Lube, all-weather motor oil, the Pennsylvania premium-grade oil that cleans as it lubricates. You also get a safety check of batteries, spark plugs, tires, and radiator, and expert service if your car has automatic transmission. The Richfield gasoline dealer is specially trained to protect your car against wear and breakdown. So get Richfield all-point safety service tomorrow. Look for the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. And tonight starred Mr. Vincent Price. Bloodbath was written by James Poe. Others in the cast were Wally Mayer, Ted DeCorsia, Paul Fries, and Tony Barrett. Special music arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week... You are groping your way slowly through the dark hold of a ship at sea. Moving carefully, step by step. Dreading to find what you know is there. Death in the form of a deadly Bushmaster from which there is no escape. Next week at this time, the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York invites you to escape to the Caribbean and the grim voyage of impending death. As Martin Storm tells it in his exciting tale, A Shipment of Mute Fate. Goodbye then until the same time next week when once again we offer you... Escape. Tom Hanlon speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. You have been listening to the Old Time Radio Hour, broadcast each week over the World Wide Web. You can subscribe at no charge through Apple Podcasts, Podbean, or RSS. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you can join us again next week for another hour of entertainment from the golden age of radio. Until then, this is your host, Justine Ward, saying so long for now. (laughs) 